What follows is yours for free, but it's only part of the entertainment we offer. And if you want to see the whole range and get involved, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. And now, on with the show. Hey, well, welcome to another Word in Your Ear. I'm delighted to say our guest in this particular Word in Your Ear, I first met in the year 1986. I was in Barbados to interview Mick Jagger, and the person looking after Mick Jagger was our guest today, Tony King. And Tony was a legend in the music business, even at that point, which is quite a few years ago. And I remember when I went out for dinner with Mike Appleton of Whistletest in Barbados, and I said, Tony, tell me the story of your life. I, t- don't miss anything out at all. And he did. And it was one of, one of the most entertaining evenings I've ever spent. And I thought, if only you'd write a book. Well, it's taken nearly 40 <laughs> years. Yes. It's taken nearly another 40 years, but he's done it. The tastemaker, Tony King. That's the proof. That's the bound proof. That I've got the finished copy. And that has some nice photos inside as well. Absolutely. So well, I remember, it's a terrific I, book. I I remember you, this, but I have to ask you, did you like the book? <laughs> we did. Very much. We did. Which, Very entertaining. Which, which you'll see, because I remember on that evening in Barbados, one of the first things you said was, well, I started in the music business taking Brenda Lee to the pictures. And I was delighted to see that that story is still in the book <laughs> yeah. about taking Brenda Lee to the pictures. So we'll we'll come back to your early life and family in a moment. Let's just talk about how you got into the music business and what we're talking about, the early 60s, are we talking about that, when you went to work for Decca Records as a teenager? March the 17th, 1958. Oh, right, okay, earlier than that. Yeah. What did a job involve at Decca at that time then? Sorry? What did the job involve at Decca? What did you do? Uh, well, well, I started as a 16-year-old in the what they called the sleeve department, making the sleeves for the albums. And in those days, they had liner notes on the back. And so I had to supervise the printing. and make. I was a, called a progress chaser, and I chased up the progress of the printing and the liner notes. But... I very quickly got promoted because two or three people saw that I was this bright kid who was madly enthusiastic. And I got on a job with Jeff Milner as assistant label manager for London American Records, which was the label at the time. You know, everybody, London American, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Jerry Lee, the Drifters, they were all on, they were all on uh, London American at one time. It was great. So that was kind of the coolest job you could possibly have in the British music business at the time. When I was 16. God. And, and, and charged with meeting people like Phil Spector and the Ronettes off the plane and, and, and just entertaining them and looking after them, right? Sorry, I can you say again? And, and you were charged with, with, with uh, you know, meeting people like Phil Spector and, and the Ronettes at the airport and then just looking after them and, uh, and making sure they're OK and taking them out for dinner. I looked after Phil separately when he came over by himself and he hung out with Andrew Oldham a lot and they were like a couple of naughty school children together. They were really, and the Ronettes, uh, they were really naughty and they gave me a hard time in my job a little bit, getting things achieved and done, getting them down to jukebox jury, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the Ronettes came separately and I was late at the airport, and I thought, oh, my God, I hope I see them. And there they were, the hair up to here, the legs all going in the same direction <laughs> with their little bags. And I said, oh, hi, you know, I'm your guy. And we had a better, he had the best time together. I love Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Spector. She was so great. And Estelle had started dating George Harrison. So it was kind of interesting. <laughs> So you started off, uh, and you were kind of doing promotions where you would call it getting things on the radio and television and so that. I I moved up from the label manager job to, uh, because I saw uh, Tony Hall, um, and I I thought, who is this guy in these sharp suits and everything? And I found out he ran what was called the promotion department in um, Hanover Square. 
So I I got a job with him. I I actually heard a rumor that he was looking and it, uh, I was on his list and I said, am I? And he said, well, no, but do you want to be? And I said, yeah. So I ended up getting the job as a promotion man, which involved uh, looking after all the American artists that came over as well as plugging records. Well, was, and there was a lot of other pluggers at the time. And um, as a gay man, that's when I first started feeling, oh, okay, there are other gay people in the world because quite a few of the pluggers were gay. There was a mixture of straight and gay. And, it, and so it gave me almost permission to be myself a little bit more. I didn't have to cover up, you know. Yes, when you were, first, you talk about in the book, when you were first offered the job by Tony Hall, I think his wife said to you, are you homosexual? I'm a father. And she is so fantastic. And she was my mentor. And, and she, I remember her looking at me and saying, are you a homosexual, darling? And I thought, the job depends on this. So I just said, no, I'm not. Do you think if you'd said you were, you would have still got the job? Sorry? If you said you were, would you have still got the job? I had a feeling maybe not. A couple of years later, I, when they, we all knew each other much, much better, I told them that. And my father said, no, no, darling, that's not the case. It wouldn't. And I said, I'm sorry, I disagree with you. I actually think that Tony wanted you to ask me the question because he was in two minds about it. Because Tony was... He was dead straight, you know, and he and he hadn't he had not really much experience of being around gay people. But anyway, once I got the job, he was fine because I did a good job. It didn't really matter whether I was gay or not. Well, it mattered actually. It mattered to my to his advantage because I had all this free time to take these people out and save him the job. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us about plugging a record in those days. A lot of it depended on the on the request programs, didn't it, on the BBC? Housewife's Choice was the one. Family Favourites. Family Favourites. Yeah. Family Favourites. How's the weather, Jean? Oh, it's raining here, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elton and I still joke about Family Favourites. Sometimes he'll say to me, What's the weather like there, Jean? <laughs> How's the weather been, Jean? I go, not so bad, Bill. I mean, we still joke about it. There was family favourites. And then later on, there were plug shows like Saturday Club, Easy Beat. You know, Ron Belcher did Easy Beat. Bernie Andrews did Saturday Club. Well, Jimmy Grant did Saturday Club first off. And then he be later became my landlord because I rented a flat off him in Fulham, where he lived. And then Bernie took over. And the great, the great advantage about being a plugger was that sometimes, you know, for instance, when the Beatles first came about and they'd do Saturday Club at, at um, Aeolian Hall, I think it was, down on the embankment. And Bernie would call me up and he'd say, I've got the Beatles coming in this afternoon. Do you want to come and, uh, and say hello? So I used to go and I used to watch the Beatles sing four songs. And I'd be sitting in the auditorium just currently is quietly enjoying the Beatles and it's and me just just me in the audience. <laughs> so you got to know these groups before you necessarily worked for them. I mean, because you, you work for all these people eventually, but uh, you just I met. Knew, I knew the uh, I I knew the Beatles because uh, I had met them at a radio show called Pop In with Keith Fordyce. And when they were plugging Please Please Me and I was plugging Let's Dance by Chris Montez. And they burst into the green, green room, boom, you know, like, like a thousand watt bulb. And I went, oh, God, who's this? <laughs> and John Lennon especially, I thought, wow, what a character this one is. And we started to talk and we both, we discovered we all like the same kind of music, you know like Motown, which in those days came out on the Oriole label. And there was a sweet little guy called Ronnie Bell who used to do all the promo for Oriole. And I used to get Ronnie to give me records for George and Ringo and drop them out and send them to their flat on the Green Street opposite Tony Hall's flat. And uh, so we were all 
all of us, and Beatles, Stones, everybody, we were all keen on the same music, you know, because all of a sudden the pop music became the thing, you know. So how did you get to know the Stones? Well, I first saw the Stones in the singing club in Ham Yard. And Chrissy Shrimpton, who went to work for Jeff Milne, who I like worked for in London American, Chrissy and I were quite friendly. And she said, oh, my boyfriend's in a band. You want to come down and see him tonight? So I went <laughs> to, the, to the singing club in Ham Yard. And there were the Rolling Stones, you know, and I, they played and it wasn't full. It was half, it was about half full and they played. And I thought, yeah, they're OK, but I like the Beatles. I was, I was a Beatle fanatic in the beginning, you know, I wasn't a Stones person at all. And then I met Mick, who was completely indifferent to meeting me. It was almost like, who, <laughs> you know, he was he wasn't he, he wasn't that impressed. And so. That was my initial meeting with them, but until I went to work for Andrew, and then, of course, I became great friends with them. Right. So you worked for Andrew Oldham, and then you worked for George Martin, didn't you? It sort of... Well, I worked for George and the other three producers at Air London, Peter Sullivan, Ron Richards, and John Burgess, who did The Hollies, Manfred Mann, George did Beatles, Scylla, Peter did... Um, Tom and Engelbert. So, you know, there was a wide variety of people that, that came under that umbrella, you know. Right. But you, you were, I mean, you were you were present when the Beatles did All You Need Is Love in uh, yeah, I Abbey went, Road. I went to that with Patty. And, I mean, when you get a finished copy of the book, there's a picture of Patty and I on our way to the All You Need Is Love session. What are you wearing, Tony? Oh, <laughs> good question. <laughs> I can do it top to tail if you really want. Yeah, go on, go on, go on. We want, we want to know. Yeah, we do. I'm wearing some soft leather blue shoes that I'd bought in Saint Tropez when I'd been there on a weekend with Andrew Oldham, who called me up one Sunday and said, "Do you want to come to the south of France?" So I turned the dinner off and went to the south of France. But, <laughs> and when I came back, the dinner had gone mouldy. <laughs> so. Yes, so then I, when I was down there, I bought a lovely pair of lime green pants and these blue, soft blue moccasin shoes. So I had those on. And then I had a caftan that was made by a lady called Thea Porter, who made all the court caftans at the time. She was the person. And then I had this like straw hat with feather in it and then quite a lot of beads. So, you know, I was... That is absolutely superb. <laughs> it's around this time you talk about uh, George and Patty inviting you to go and stay for weekends down in their, uh, in, in Isha, I think they were living. Uh, Give uh, us some idea of what that was like. It's just, that's a very uh, exciting idea. Once uh, I got to know George and Patty, they started inviting me down. And in the beginning, it was lovely. It was really cosy. They had a, a nice kind of like luxury bungalow i suppose you'd call it you know but and it was just always great fun and in the early days before the marahishi we used to have shepherd's pie <laughs> and uh, sit down and enjoy a shepherd's pie and listen to music and chat and have a laugh uh, i remember down once i was down there it's not in the book this so it's, it is a little exclusive book. <laughs> I was down there and the bell rang and it was someone from the Daily Express and I, <clears throat> on the intercom. So George said to me, would you go and find out what they want? So I said, yeah, sure. So I went down and there was this lone reporter standing at the gates and I said, um, what is it you want? And he said, well, Paul McCartney has just admitted to having taken LSD. And I wondered if George had any comments on it. And I said, probably not, I would think. And so I went back and I told George what happened. And I said to the guy through the intercom, we won't be commenting on it. But that's why he rang the bell, because, you know, Paul had said he'd taken LSD. I think they all took it when they went to this dentist dinner party. That's right. And uh, then they went to the ad lib and they thought the lift was on fire. 
they were all so out of it. They all thought the lift was on fire. But uh, anyway, then subsequently, when I went down to George's, once he got into the Marahishi period of his life, you'd have those characters called the Fool, Simon and Mariahka, the ones who painted the outside of Apple and painted John's Rolls Royce. They would be staying there and they painted George's Mini and they painted his fireplace. And um, they were all kind of like, oh yeah, man, really, man. Yeah, man, very cool, man. Don't talk loud, man. Talk in this lovely, peaceful voice, man. And I got a bit bored with it. So I, I thought I'm going out for a walk. And I went for a walk and one of them said, uh, one of the Simon Marika people said, where are you going, man? And I said, I'm going down to the pub for a Guinness, man. <laughs> 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 so anyway it was fun and then george once he had some nice carpet and he said do you want some carpet for your flat so i said yeah so he gave me this nubby roll of carpet that they didn't want and i i put it in my flat in fulham <laughs> george and i stayed friends throughout you know so how do you what do you think is the quality that you you have had to be able to do this kind of job and to be in the confidence of these people for such a long time? I, I, you know, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest with you. I, I'm very friendly. I've got a very good sense of humour. I had good instincts about music. Um, I had reasonably good taste. Hence the title of the book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And people were just, people just liked me. And I, I was chatty and talkative and fun to be with, you know. Patsy loved hanging out with me because we always had a laugh. And Charlie Watts and his wife and I became very, very big friends. And they, they loved me to go and stay with them at the weekend and go on holidays with them in the south of France and their house in the bar. And um, not in the bar, in the Languedoc. They had a lovely goat, uh, house that used to be make chèvre cheese, and it, they turned it into a lovely, lovely, um, a lovely house. And of course, sadly, in this last year, we lost both of them. Yeah, and, of course, of yeah, course. Yeah, you know, I just, and I used to go out with Andrew Old, and we go clubbing, and we. We'd see the Beatles and the Beat. Everybody got used to me being as part of the scene, you know. So I was known by by everybody as being someone who was on the scene. You got a ready, steady go on Fridays. And Vicky Wickham and Michael Lindsay Hogg and all the other artists, the small faces. I was very friendly with the small faces. I was just part part of the gang, I guess. Let's talk about Elton John, because obviously when you first came across Elton John, it was Reg, wasn't it? Yes, he was. Uh, I was at Dick James Music because uh, George Martin and the other guys didn't have room for me in their company at, to start with. And they had a publishing company, went through Dick James. So Dick very kindly gave me a, an office on the second floor opposite Larry Page. So uh, who is in touch with me on Facebook now? And uh, so I started working there and I'd go down to the front desk opposite Dick's office and quite often there would be this character there, this little character. And I just started and he was wanted to get to know me because he knew that I knew the Beatles and he knew that I knew the Stones and he knew that I'd worked with the Stones and I was working for George Martin. So he was kind of impressed. So he made a point of but he was very shy, wasn't he, at this point? Oh, yeah. He wouldn't say boo to a goose. He was very shy. And, and, and we kind of almost looked down when he spoke to you, you know. But um, I started to get friendly with him. And, but he, he had something. He had a little bit of something. He was so enthusiastic about music. And he had a very good sense of humour. And he was incredibly sharp. And I got him some session work on Holly's session. Yeah, the Baron Knights, I think it was, wasn't it? Heavy and yeah. Baron Knights. And then, uh, you know, I, I, I got him to do, uh, there was a demo for Jerry Lorden, 
who wrote Apache and Jerry couldn't reach the notes. So Elton said to me, or Reggie, as he was at the time, do you want me to sing it? I said, well, can you sing? <laughs> I said, well, I'll have a go. And he did it. And when I took it in the next day and played it to air, John Burgess said to me, who's that singing? And I said, oh, it's Reg. He said, he's not bad, is he? And I said, no, I was quite surprised. I didn't know he could sing. <laughs> Can you remember when he'd first told you he was going to be called Elton? Yes. I th well, uh, he told me, I think, shortly before he went off to America, one time he said to me, or maybe it was after he'd first been to America, around about that time, he, but he did actually say to me, I'm officially changing my name now, so I don't want to be called Reg anymore. So I said, okay, it'll be a bit difficult to start with. And so I never used to say anything. I never used to say Reg or Elton. I just used to say, speak to him like he was another person, but I, unnamed. <laughs> One day I was talking to him and I said the word Elton and I said, oh my God, I just said it. <laughs> But did you, you've obviously met loads of people, you know, who've become absolute superstars. Do you recognize some quality in them when you first meet them that you think they've got the drive to they, make it? They all have a little bit of magic, which is essential, but they're all hard workers. And they always got their eye on the ball and they're and they're 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 kind of self-centered you know to be honest you have to be they're all very self-centered i mean and you have to be if you want to be that famous you've got to make you've got to be very self-contained and very self-centered i remember once i said to mick what made you do all this and he said I just like showing off. He said, no, I was a good show off. And um, my grandmother who raised me loved me because she said, oh, that Mick Jagger, he's got so much life in him. That was my, and my, she preferred, she really loved him. But I think they were all um, very hard workers too. And very, very professional. The big three, Elton, John, and um, Mick were all extremely professional. And I learned a lot of them, but I was up to the mark. I could keep up with them, you know, and I knew how, and I had a, a sort of this nice relationship with all of them, you know, but it, a lot of it was professional as well as personal because they respected my abilities and what I could do to help them along with their careers in different ways. There's a really interesting passage where you finish up working with John Lennon uh, in the early 70s, and he, he needs advice as to how to kind of, you know, you feel that he's not appealing to people in the right way because he's too political. What did you tell him? What, what did you advise him to do? Well, we had dinner, and um, well, though when I couldn't park the car, because I was so nervous with him being in the Thunderbird. <laughs> now, why I rented a Thunderbird, God only knows. But anyway, <laughs> another story. Bloody like great tank of a car. Anyway, I could not reverse park. So I said to John, please get out of the car because I can't do it with you in the car. Can you just go in the restaurant and sit down? And he had May Pang with him, and who he was with at the time. And they went and sat down, and I parked the car. And then we sat down and we had dinner. And he was very amused about me not being able to park the car. And, and it, was, it was an icebreaker, actually, because it made him laugh. And we started chatting. And he started, he told me he had this album coming out, Mind Games. And he wanted to know, I had just finished doing promotion and putting all the Ringo album together, all the artwork elements and everything. He said, would you stay on for a little while longer and help me with mind games? So I said, yeah, sure. But, you know, John, if you really want to do this, I, you're going to have to do some interviews and you're going to have to do be a bit more user friendly than you've been over the last few years because you've allied yourselves with some political characters for 
genuine reasons, but it hasn't left you in a good position because you're on Nixon's hit list and you need to be seen as much more friendly. So he said, do it. Just get on with it and do it and just tell me what you want me to do. Like that. So I said, okay, and that's what I did. I, I talked to Billboard, talked to Record World, talked to Cream Magazine, talked to, we did Grey Whistle Test. Um, I got him to do the Grey Whistle Test. Yes, he did. And we did, and that was, a, I thought the Grey Whistle Test was great. <laughs> it's one of my favorite interviews that he did. And um, we did lots of, lots of uh, promotion. And then all of a sudden he became, he did quite well with, with Mind Games. It wasn't a huge number one, but it was a, bit, a bigger success than sometime in New York City had been, you know. And he was on his way back. And then he went in and then, then we had the disaster of the rock and roll album and all the Phil Spector shenanigans, guns and what have you, and me wrestling with John and everything. But I'm jumping there. Uh, so, that, yeah, so that's that's kind of how I, I, it all came about. Is that answer your question? Yes, right. it does. So you, you talk about in the book, I think there was a, there was a kind of, tribute to charlie watts wasn't that quite recently at ronnie scott's and uh, and which you were involved in and um and mick and keith came along and so forth so you still see these people that you've, you've known for an awful long time well i hadn't seen them at that point for quite a while so when i because you know the covid and all that even the charlie's part uh, uh I want to say party, but the tribute party, we all had to take a, a test before we could go. You know, the piece, what was that? What were those tests called? PCR or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. All had, we all had to do that. And I hadn't seen them for ages. Uh, although Mick and I always swap Christmas presents. We always send each other a book. Oh, really? Yeah, he sent me the Bob Stanley book this time. Oh, nice. Oh, very good. Lovely. Yeah, about pop music from yes, Nazi. yeah, let's do it or whatever it's called, they isn't it? That this year, uh, and signed it and everything. But I hadn't seen them for ages, and they they were so sweet to me, and they were so. Um, Mick sidled up next to me, and he didn't tell me he was there. And I was talking to some friends of mine, and their eyes were getting wider and wider, and they were going things like. <laughs> <laughs> looked to his side, looked, and I turned around and there he was. And I said, oh my God, there you are. <laughs> and we had a lovely chat and Keith and his Keith and his family were really sweet to me. His daughters were really sweet to me. Keith was really sweet to me. And it was really a, a, a very sweet evening because not only was Charlie my dear friend and Shirley, of course, but I'm godfather to his daughter and granddaughter. Oh, right. So he really goes down mm. the generations. Yes. Uh, yeah. Serafina, his oldest daughter, is my. She's in touch with me now. We we Facebook and we send each other Instagram things. Of, I send her things on cats because she knows I love cats. So anytime I see a good cat story, I forward it on to her. <laughs> So we always said we've discussed this in the past on podcast. Tony King will never write his his uh, his story, you know. But so, what made you um, decide now's the time to write the story? Lockdown. Oh right, just Simple having time. Well, I I I I wasn't working because I I my time at Rocket came to an end because the tour closed down and I was working on the Elton tour from a creative director the tour closed down so there wasn't there wasn't much for me to do so I was basically at a loose end and then David Williams has always been keen for me to write a book and he said to me well now's the time Tony and I thought maybe he was right you know I'm I'm coming up to 80 now is the time to do it. So I went to his publisher to start with because he fixed up an appointment. But that was, 
and I sub it, it wasn't quite right financially. And then I got an agent and we went to Faber and Faber and I got a ghost, wonderful ghost writer, Tom Bromley. And off we went to the races. <laughs> I never wanted to do a book. I never, it was always, people would say to me, when are you going to do a book? And I'd say, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't be bothered. I was always, I always thought I can't be bothered, cut the conversation dead, you know. I, I, that was my conversation killer. Can't be bothered. But uh, anyway, I did I did get bothered and I've written it. Now, of course, I open it and I think, oh my God, I can't believe, I can't read my own words. I, <laughs> I read it, I get embarrassed. And I think, did I really want to, you know, it's, is this really all right? So you guys going to have to back me up. Well, it, it, it's terrific. It, it's more than all right. Tanya. Really good. Uh, uh, and I'm we delighted. I'm delighted that all those years after you told me the story of uh, taking Brenda Lee to the pictures and loads of other stories, that and millions of other stories are in this. The Tastemaker by Tony King, My Life with the Legends and Geniuses of Rock Music. It's been lovely talking to you, Tony.